here. Happy Easter, man. If you haven't, if you've escaped somebody saying happy Easter to you, you've had earplugs in all morning because it's been everywhere, right? You can't escape. You can't open up social media without somebody wishing you a happy Easter. But I want to wish you happy Easter and welcome you here. If you don't know me, my name is Joel and I'm the pastor here. And what you need to know about me, a couple of things. This may be some new information for our members. This may, most of our members will be like, yeah. But if you're new with us, here's some things you need to know about me. Number one, I love Jesus. Man, Jesus is everything. And I love Jesus. That's why I'm so glad we're here this morning. I'm so glad that we get to celebrate our King this morning and worship him. What an incredible time that was of worshiping him with our, with our praise team this morning. The other thing is, you need to know about me, the second most important thing is that I absolutely love my wife. Oh my goodness. Besides Jesus, she is the most incredible thing in this world to me, her and my kids. I love, love my wife and my, my kids. And then the third, down the list quite a ways, but still probably the third thing you need to know about me is that... I love sports. Man, the sports are just awesome. And I love, I love watching sports. I love rooting for my teams. I love watching all sports, just, just being engaged in sport. I love sports. And in fact, if you have a conversation with me here or elsewhere, if we're just at a coffee shop, I guarantee you, at some point in the conversation, we will talk about Jesus, my wife and family, or sports. At some time in that conversation, that will encompass those who have had conversations conversations with me, I've said that, you know, those, one of those three topics are going to come up, maybe even all three, but I just love, I love those three things. I love what they bring. And you know what, for those of you who, uh, some of you are right along with me, man, you sports and you, I just said your ears perked up, but some, I know you, you're, you're not huge sports fans, but let me tell you why I love sports. I love the competition of it. I love the the winning, the, the winning and the defeat. Yes, the defeat. Because it's in the defeat that victory is so sweet, right? It's in those moments where we understand defeat that makes the victory, when the victory does come, so incredible. Now, for me, most of my sports rooting, my fandom, has been a pretty miserable experience. Yes, because I'm a Northwest kid, and so my teams are the Seattle Mariners. You can cry for me later. Uh, uh, the Blazers, which they're in the playoffs this today. You may make sure you support our team today. Um, and then, even up to a couple years ago, though, uh, being a Seahawk fan was not a great thing. Up until a few years ago. Now, we've had some, a run of success here over the last few years. But, uh, but up until a while ago, it was, it was pretty sad. A couple years ago, though, if you remember, if you were watching, we had a couple playoff games, the Seahawks did. And one was versus the Green Bay Packers. And it was probably the greatest, the, probably the second greatest comeback I've ever seen in my life. Man, they, all hope was lost. We were down. To, it was miserable. And we were down. And we were, it was looking like in the, in the NFC Championship game, man, we were going to lose it. We were going to miss out on going to the Super Bowl again. And then we had the comeback. And it was a great comeback. And we came back and we won and we went to the Super Bowl. Two weeks later in the Super Bowl, we understood, Seahawk fans understood what crushing defeat looks like. Because if you were here with me that day, you may have seen me cry. <laughs> My good friend Rob, who taught with me last week on stage, is crying right now because it's a painful memory. We were on the goal line. We were going to win the second Super Bowl, back-to-back -back Super Bowls. <sighs> And what the quarterback should have done is gone like this and handed the ball off and we would have been Super Bowl champs. Instead, he tried to throw and he throws an interception, crushing defeat. Now, I realize this sitting in the back. One of our deacons is a Patriots fan. And so for me or him, in my defeat, in my agony, he was celebrating. And that's just sport, isn't it? That there is painful defeats. There is agonizing defeats. And then there is amazing victories. And it's in the defeat, in the agony of defeat, that makes you appreciate the victory so much more. And that's what draws us to sports. And that's really why we're here this morning. 
Easter is all about victory. It is the greatest comeback of all time. It, I said that that the Super Bowl is the second greatest comeback. The first greatest comeback is what we're going to be talking about today because Easter is all about the greatest comeback, the greatest, uh, greatest miracle of all time. It's all about the resurrection from the dead. Now, we all know what loss feels like. Maybe we take this outside of sport into, into real life. We all know what loss feels like. Maybe it's loss of loved ones. We know what that feels like, the pain that that brings. Maybe it's that we live in fear. Some of us live in fear this morning of losing loved ones. Maybe it's not that for you, but maybe you've experienced a loss of a dream, a loss of a marriage or a job or maybe even your home. Maybe this morning you walked through the door struggling with an addiction that you just never thought you'd struggle with, but right now it just seems like it's got its grip on you and it feels like the darkness is over, overshadowing and overtaking you. Maybe it's in your marriage and that romance and that spark that you all once had is just dwindling down in your marriage and it feels like hope is, is lost. Maybe you feel defeated in that area. Some of you in your homes and your relationships within your family are just, there's just tension there and you, you're not sure what to do and, and it feels like defeat there. And every time you walk in, it feels like defeat. And I know that for, for some of us, the, the people that we once dreamed we were going to be, those dreams we had as young people, as, as, as our children, we, we're, those are just a fading memory now. And, and we began to settle into a life where it's just, it feels like the darkness sometimes wins. It feels like defeat is taking place in our lives and that darkness always wins. And we all have... We've all had these dreams and it just doesn't seem like they're, they're coming to fruition in our life and it's frustrating and, it's, and, and it feels down. The, 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 the victory is not at hand. It actually feels like the opposite this morning for you. And I understand that. They say that 74.56% that of statistics are made up. I'll let you choose whether or not that one was made up or not. But I do know that there is one statistic that is true for all of us, every single person in this place, is that we all experience death. We all experience death. And as strange as it sounds, death is what brings us here together today. Death is what brings us together to celebrate Easter. Because you can't have Easter without a death. You can't have a resurrection without a death coming first. And so today we are here to celebrate Easter because, because a death happened. We've been in our series, if you've been along with us journeying, if you've been here or if you've been listening online, um, we, we've been in our series called King Jesus and we've been looking over the last two weeks and we'll continue into, into the next coming weeks, but we'll, we've been looking at, our, uh, at Jesus from the title of king. Now, throughout scripture, we see lots of different titles for Jesus, right? We see the most famous is Christ, okay? Often we hear that Jesus, Jesus Christ, and then Christ was a title. It wasn't his last name, okay? So Jesus and Christ was a title. We also see other titles like Lord and, and Savior and, and Master and Son of David, but there was this other title in the Bible called king, in fact, it's king of kings, we see it in the Bible. That there are kings, and we all understand kingship at some level because we've watched movies and read books. We understand that there's kings, and they think they're all powerful. But there is a king that is above all kings, and that's Jesus, and that's who we worship. That even at, even at the name of Jesus, the kings of the world will one day submit their knee to him. 
So we've been exploring what it means that we, the title King Jesus. And we've been looking at how Jesus interacted with people as he walked around for the, th- for the 33 years that he walked on earth, but especially those last three years of his life and his ministry. We've been watching as Jesus interacts with people and how, he's, how he heals people and how he talks to people and how he, how he interacts with different people. And we even looked at last week how our king became a servant of, of all. So we've been exploring what this means, that Jesus is our king. And although, if you read through the Gospels, although Jesus was healing people and he was interacting with, uh, with um, sinners and with tax collectors and with the down and outs, and, and Jesus was interacting with all these kind of people and, and healing people and cleansing diseases and, and interacting with people, for the most part, the majority of people were pretty happy with what Jesus was doing for them, but he rubbed some people the wrong way. They were the religious leaders of the day, the religious uh, Pharisees and Sadducees. And Jesus, man, he just made them mad because he was challenging them and what they had always taught. And so Jesus created in, in just by the way he taught, he got some enemies. He had people that didn't like him. And this all came to a head when he was about 33 years old. The tension really mounted And Jesus knew what was coming. In fact, if you read towards the end of each of the Gospels, Jesus begins to warn his followers. He begins to warn his disciples that that he was going to die, that he was going to be put to death, but that not to worry that three days later he was going to raise from the dead. And he began to tell his followers that, and he began to warn them that. His followers didn't really understand what that means. They had no context to put that in. And, and even his, uh, one of his closest followers, Peter, Peter spoke up one time when Jesus was saying that, and he rebuked Jesus for saying that. And he said, far be it from me, Lord, you will never, you will never die. And Peter, and Jesus just kind of shook his head and said, you just, you just don't get it, Peter. You just don't get it. They couldn't believe. They had no no context for it. But then on Good Friday, it happened. Jesus would be arrested the night before and falsely tried and nailed to, to the cross to die for our sins, to die for sins that he never committed, never committed a sin. But yet he died on the cross, falsely accused. And in mockery of Jesus, in mockery of this title king, they put this sign on top of the cross. Pilate had this sign put on top of the cross that said, Jesus, king of the Jews, just just mocking him. And and, and soldiers would stand around and they they were mocking him and telling him, well, if you're really a king, if you're really who you say you are, just, just come on down. Just show us, just prove us wrong. And Jesus hung in there because he was on mission and he was on, he was on a mission to die for sins that he never committed, sins that you and I have committed. Then at noon on Friday, the Bible says a darkness covered the whole sky. It's almost in that moment as if even the sky, even the weather was mocking Jesus and his followers. The darkness is going to win. The darkness is covering the whole situation. And now at 3, 3 p.m., Jesus cries out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the Bible says he breathed his last and, a, and the earth trembled, an earthquake hit. And in, those, in that moment, in that moment, I just want us to put ourselves in the position of his followers standing there at the foot of the cross. And I guarantee it was one of those moments in life where everything seemed to be in slow motion and there may have been noise all around, but it must have just felt silent. As all hope seemed lost in that moment, all the dreams, all the things that they had thought that this king would do for them, all, the, all their aspirations and dreams hang there dead. Defeated, what were they going to do? Have you ever felt that way? Like the thing that you would put your, all your hopes, all your dreams, all your aspirations in just seemed gone. 
just seemed like it had gone away. What do you do now? Thankfully, the story doesn't end there. Thank God that the story doesn't end with Jesus hanging on a cross. And for you and I, followers of Jesus, people who put their faith in Jesus, the story doesn't end when all hope seems lost. The story doesn't end in hopelessness and darkness and despair. And that's why we're here. That's why we celebrate Easter. Because we don't leave Jesus on the cross and Jesus didn't stay on the cross and in Matthew 28, we're going to hang out there all morning long. If you have your Bible, if it's sitting around you, or if you have a smartphone, you can turn open your Bible app to Matthew 28, and we are going to look at the greatest comeback story of all time. The greatest comeback. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay. It's going to be on the screen, but turn, if you, if you have one, to Matthew 28. And in starting in, in verse 1, this is right, Jesus, he was hanging on the cross and a guy named Joseph of Arimathea came and he took the body and he put it in his own grave. The grave that he had bought and purchased for himself, he had Jesus put in the grave and the Roman soldiers, the Roman guards were so, they were afraid that, the, that the, his disciples may come and steal the body and so they had this huge, massive stone. It took, I don't know how many guys, but they rolled this stone into place to cover the entrance to the tomb, sealing off the tomb. And so we pick the story up right there in Matthew 28, starting in, in verse 1. It says this, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Mary Magdalene here and the other Mary uh, were there on Friday. They were there standing at the foot of the cross when they saw Jesus die. They were part of the followers that, see it, that all hopes seemed lost, that it just seemed like darkness had won. And, and for these ladies, they're coming to the tomb. Why, are they, why would they come to the tomb? I mean, it's already, seal, it's already sealed up. What, what were they doing here? They were coming to... Prepare the, they were coming to just pay their respects, essentially. They were coming with, with herbs and spices that they leave at the tomb. It's much like how you and I would go to a tomb today and leave flowers. It was a sign of respect and of love, a sign of, of admiration. And they were coming there to, to pay their last respects. They were coming there expecting to find a corpse. They were not expecting what they saw. They were coming to expect, they, they weren't coming to a resurrection. They were coming to see and just pay their final respects to see Jesus the way they had left him because they had forgotten what Jesus said. They had forgotten that Jesus told them before. They were part of the group. They had heard Jesus say that three days later he was going to rise from the dead, but they, they had forgotten. Could it be said that, that that's why some people come to church that they come to pay their respects. They come to sing a few songs, hear a few words spoken, maybe observe a couple traditions to pay their respects. Not expecting to find a life, a living Savior, a living Jesus, but just, just to go through and do this, the motions. They weren't, they weren't expecting to find Jesus. You see, most of the world today thinks of church as just tradition, empty ritual, talk. But I love what the Apostle Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians 4.20. He writes this to the church there, and he's saying, for the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, in other words, the kingdom of God is not about ritual. It's not about, it's not about tradition. It's not about coming and singing a few songs and observing a couple words and, and saying a few nice things. The kingdom of God is about power. It's about the power of God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's about him alive, not only just that day, but every day in and through us. It's not a message of an emptiness, an empty, uh, an empty message. It's about an empty grave. 
because our king rose again. The story continues now in verse two. And behold, there was a great earthquake, the second great the earthquake that hit. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I love this, man. This angel comes from heaven. Just, we're going to find out in a moment how he comes, but he descends, he rolls the stone back away, and then he just sits on the grave. Or he sits on the the stone, right? He's just sitting there. What up? I'm here, right? Right? I mean, I don't know, but if we kind of look into this and we just imagine this whole scene and this angel just coming down and just sitting, what's going on? I'm an angel. Well, what's, we find out how it looked. It looked, the appearance, his appearance was like lightning. We had lightning a couple days ago uh, on, on Friday, actually, and I was driving here to the church, and I saw this huge lightning, this crack of lightning, and it was like, usually here we get the flash of lightning. I actually saw a bolt come down, and I kind of picture it like this, that a bolt of lightning comes flying down right here, and the angels are just there. He appears, and he has white clothes like snow. And fear came on the guards. They trembled and became like dead men. And before we give them too much of a hard time, I think we would too. I think you would too, right? If we saw exactly what took place, an angel coming down like a lightning bolt, rolling the stone away, and then sitting on this rock, like, what's going on? I think we'd hit the deck too, right? They all just fall over. They all just, they can't handle it. And I asked myself though in this, why did the, why did the angel roll the stone away? Uh, It wasn't as though Jesus was standing on their side knocking like, hey, let me out of here. Come on. I need some, help me out here. I need some help. No, we know at this point, like when Jesus resurrected body, we see later on in scripture that like he can, he can like walk through walls. I, and Jesus had, would have had no problem just coming out, leaving the stone in, intact and just, and just coming out. Why did the angels roll the stone away? I think it's for the benefit of Mary and Mary and the disciples and for you and me. The angel rolled the stone away because he wanted those there and he wants you and I to come again to the grave and peer in and see that it's empty and see that the body is not there. You see, this, the stone was rolled away not for Jesus' benefit, but for ours, so that we could see that death didn't win, that the, that, that the grave was the empty, that the darkness didn't overcome, and that Jesus, our King, rose victoriously, conquering death so that whoever places their faith in Jesus, for us, death is beaten, death is crushed, and we come together today to celebrate a risen king, not a corpse. We're not looking for a corpse because death was defeated. The stone was rolled away and our king lives. And we can live too if we place our faith in Jesus. So let me ask you a question. What stone do you need God to roll away for you? What stone is in the way of you believing in Jesus? What is it that needs to be rolled away in your life so that you can peer in and see that Jesus is not in the grave still, that he's alive in us? The story goes on in verse five. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. That's just angel talk. Every time they show up in the Bible, they say, don't be afraid. And I think it's so that people don't drop over dead because we saw what happened with the guards. Before he said, do not be afraid, people are falling over left and right. But now that he says, do not be afraid, apparently the Mary and Mary, they're they're all right. (laughs) Just an observation from scripture. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. For I know, the angel says, I know why you're here. I know why you came. I know that you forgot what Jesus told you. And that you are here 
You're here seeking the crucified one. You're here seeking a corpse. I know that. I know why you came. And I find great comfort in this, that God know, knew their hearts, and I believe that he knows our hearts as well. And he knows, God knows, that, that some of us here today have forgotten. We've forgotten what Jesus said. We've forgotten his God's word. We forget what he says. We forget and just get overcome by darkness sometimes. He knows that, that we have this tendency to forget the victory that was won that day on the cross on the, and through the resurrection. And that as we walk through life, sometimes we walk around as though Jesus is still in the grave. We walk around sometimes like these women who come to seek Jesus, but we expect to find no life there. We expect to find defeat there. And the angel just says, I know. I know, I know, it's okay. And I know that some of you may have even come here this morning expecting to find just a story, just to come and hear the story again told, or maybe it's just a tradition, or somebody invited you to breakfast and you end up showing up at church, I don't know. But I hope today that you will look again into the grave that you will look again into the tomb where the body is there no more and that you will see that Jesus is alive, that you will symbolically look there again. Maybe you came today expecting one thing and my prayer today is that you leave and you find something different this morning. The angel goes on, he is not here for he has risen as he said. That's so important. As he said, come and see the place where he lay. The ladies had forgotten, they, and they made their own assumption based on the circumstances. They just assumed that they knew what had happened. They just assumed that they were coming to find a corpse. They just assumed based on circumstances, based on what they last saw, the, the state they last saw Jesus in, they just made some assumptions as to what was going on. And I know because I've struggled with this that it's easy to forget God's word, especially in the midst of tough circumstances when life seems dark and there doesn't seem to be any hope and you, it just... Darkness seems to be closing in around and the circumstances in life don't seem like they have much hope in them. It's easy to make your own assumptions about what's taking place or make your own assumptions about what Jesus is or is not doing. And we put our, own, our faith in our own judgment, in our own assumptions, rather than coming to God's word, rather than coming back to the story and looking in and seeing the empty grave. We put, we put our trust in our, own, in our own assumptions. God gave us his word, though, to lead us to true life so that we could come and see where he lay. Look at the proof, he, the angel says. He's not here. And there are a bunch of proofs that, that, that explain the resurrection. There's a, a lot of proofs that that uh, back up this story that we don't have time to get into. But if you'd like to, if you're having trouble believing the story and you'd like to go through those, I, I encourage you, come talk to me after this message. And I'd love to be able to share that with you and some of those things. But the angel right here, listen, guys, if, if this was a made-up story, the stone wouldn't have been rolled away. We would have just said that Jesus just came out. And the angel certainly wouldn't have said, hey, come here, come look at the place where he laid. He's not here. He is risen. Come and see that. And I think that this is why, I think this is why God created the church and why, what's so powerful about the church and what's so powerful about us gathering together each week and coming back and especially the time that we just observe of communion, is that we get to each week symbolically come back and look again into the grave and see he's not there, for he's risen. We don't worship a dead king. We worship a risen king. Then the angel says to the ladies, then go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. 
So they departed quickly and ran from the tomb with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. I mean, can you imagine just the emotion that these ladies must have been going through? Like they, what they all saw, what all just unfolded for them in the last like five minutes, right? Uh, like life changing. They were just coming in grief and uh, to this tomb. And then all this happens and an angel appears and shows the grave and Jesus is risen. And the angel says, go quickly and, and tell the disciples that he's risen from the dead. And they're like, oh, oh okay, let's go. He said, go, go, just, just go. Hey, by the way, Jesus is going to meet you. Oh, okay. And they leave with fear and great joy. Some of us know what that, that's like, experiencing mixed emotions. This was the ultimate mixed emotion. Fear, like what in the world just happened? And great joy, like Jesus is alive. Our, our hope is not lost. Let's run. And they're running and probably stumbling all over themselves. I don't know. I'm just picturing this scene unfolding. And then, and they're just, they bump into Jesus. I love this verse. And behold, Jesus meets them and says, greetings. <laughs> I love this. I love this. The Greek here gives the idea of greetings. That's just like saying good morning. These ladies have had, they are full of mixed emotions and they're running and they're, they're confused and they bump into Jesus and Jesus says, good morning. Jesus just conquered the grave. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. You kind of expect him to be like, I am J Jesus. No, just, hey, good morning. Right? And I love this because it shows how gentle and humble our Savior is, our king is. Remember, these women, they had a, they had a lack of faith. They had a faith crisis and they didn't believe. They, they failed Jesus. They failed to, to remember what Jesus said. They failed to believe in him, even though he said that, and they, even though they saw all the miracles, they, they, didn't, they didn't believe in him. And they bump into Jesus, and rather than receiving the stink eye, or rather than getting worked over or being condemned, Jesus just, I can imagine him smiling and saying, good morning. And that's important for some of us because when we have moments of crisis in our life and we have faith crises and we forget what Jesus says and we forget the promises of God, maybe even some of us, when we walk away from Jesus, we turn our back on him and stop believing in him. And we are fearful, and sometimes we are fearful that when we, if we were to come back to God, if we were to come back to Jesus, we'd find this wrathful, vengeful God that would be angry at us. But rather than that, I think, I think we'd just hear, good morning. Good morning. And what did they do? They did the only thing that was natural when you encountered Jesus. They did the only thing that you can do when you experience the fullness of resurrected, our resurrected king. They came up, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. And friends, when we understand all of who Jesus is, and when we begin to get a glimpse of who our king is, that's the proper response. It's just to worship him. And it doesn't matter whether we've spent a whole bunch of time running away from Jesus. It doesn't matter whether or not we've had moments in our lives where we have just, we've lacked faith. We didn't believe the story to be true. We forgot that he rose again. Maybe we've just been bouncing through life unaware of him when we encounter him. And I pray that we encounter him this morning the proper response is worship, is coming to him, approaching him, closing the space between him and us and worshiping him because he invites us to do that. He invites us to come to him and experience him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. What an encounter, what an amazing moment, what a mix of emotions these women experienced. Just from that, what they were expecting to find versus what they found. 
It's just an amazing moment, amazing few moments that get recorded for us. And I think, I think that we find ourselves in that story someplace. We find ourselves in the middle of that story with Jesus. And some of us have spent a whole lot of time close to Jesus, just worshiping him. But some of us have forgotten. Some of us have maybe doubted. Maybe we just think this is a whole bunch of made up story. And that's okay. That's okay. Even some of his disciples doubted. Like this guy, Peter. Peter was one of his closest followers and and unlike, unlike the two women who actually went to the grave, Peter and the other 11 guys, they were hiding. They, were, they had gone off. They were, they were up in a room. They were just hiding. They didn't know what was going on. They were scared. They didn't believe Jesus. They, they'd forgotten what Jesus said. They, they didn't. And so these two women, as the angel told them and as Jesus told them, they went and told the disciples. And they show up, these ladies, and they knock, frantically knock on the door, and they get in. And, and the gospel writer of uh, the Luke, uh, Luke writes this down and records this for us. And he, 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 they, these women come in and they tell the disciples, they say, Jesus is not dead. He's alive, just as he said. And here's their response. But these words seem to them an idle tale. These were his followers. These were his closest dudes. These were the ones that were supposed to hang with him no matter what. And even after they reminded him of, they said, it seemed as though it was an idle tale. They did not believe them. But Peter, Peter, he rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Peter hops up from that, and I don't know how long this is. I don't, I don't know how many. He pops up, and he is on a dead sprint to that grave, man. He's not just sauntering. He's not on a brisk walk. He is at a dead sprint to see if these things are true. He got up, and he ran, and he had to see. He had to see again if what they were saying was true. And he gets there, and he stoops in, it says, and he looks again to see. And then I love this. I love the way the scripture says it. He went away marveling. He went away marveling at what had, he had seen. Uh, all of us today, every single person here, I pray that we do what Peter did. We get up and we look again into the grave. Whether or not you've been following Jesus your whole life, or maybe this is your first time in church, look into the grave again and marvel that our, the body's not there. He is not there. He has risen. He has, he has come back to life. Death has been defeated. Death is no more. And if this story is true, and I'm telling you, if maybe you are here this morning and you're doubting this story, like the disciples, that's okay. But you need, to, you need to investigate this. Because if this story is true, which I believe it is, if this story is true, it should change everything about everything in your life. If this story is true, if Jesus is not in the grave, if you run to that grave and look in and Jesus is not there, you find out that he is risen, it changes all it changes everything because it means that we don't have to live in defeat or shame or brokenness anymore that all that hope that was lost is replenished through Jesus the death that death that seemed so imminent that darkness that seemed like it was closing in it dissipates at the risen savior if this story is true everything changes there and at the beginning of this message, I said that there is no Easter without death, right? That there cannot be any resurrection without death. And that's a beautiful picture of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to become a, become a follower of Jesus. Because much like Jesus could not resurrect from the, the grave unless he died first, you and I, we cannot resurrect in this life and into heaven unless we die first. We, to, we must die to ourselves, and that's why the Bible 
has this beautiful imagery in Romans chapter 6 of what it means to become a follower of Jesus. And it gives this imagery of baptism that when we are, when we decide and we place our faith in Jesus and come to Jesus, we're called to be baptized. And what it is is that we are submerged into water. In other words, Romans 6 talks about how we are dying to ourselves, that a death must take place before a resurrection can occur. And we die to ourselves and we come up out of the water and we are resurrected to new life in Jesus. And death has no more victory. In fact, the possible, he, he writes this, oh death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? It's swallowed up. Death and the sting of death is swallowed up in victory through the power of Jesus because he is not dead. He is alive. And because of that, we have life in Jesus. And if you've never made that decision to follow Jesus and to give your life to him, you can't experience a resurrection unless you participate in that death of baptism first, where you're put into the water and brought right back up, but in that, that you die to your old way of life. And some of you are saying, well, that just seems kind of weird, Joel. That just seems kind of, I mean, like I've been trying to be a good person and just kind of running through, but, but let me ask you, how well is that working for you? How well is that working for our society today? just kind of doing things on our own, just living how we want to live, just how well is that working for our society? It's not. And it's not until we die to our own nature, our own sin, and we arise in him, and we have life in him, and we have the promise of eternal life through Jesus. And if, like I said, if you... If you're interested in that, even if you're not quite sure, if you're interested in that, please come at the end and talk to myself or one of our elders, and we'd love to walk through that process with you. But some of us, some of you here today have done that. And then you've gone back to life that seems mundane, and it seems like life is defeated and hopeless and fearful. And I'm telling you, that is not how Jesus created us to live in him. And, 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 and that's exactly where Peter and the other 11 found themselves in that room, huddled up. It looked defeated. It looked bad. It looked like all their dreams were gone away and it, the darkness was closing in. And all the other 11, they kind of hung out in the, they kind of hung out in that room still, but not Peter. No, Peter got up and he took off on a sprint to see if this thing was true. G, he was one of Jesus' closest followers and he had to go. And he ran and he looked again. And he saw that the grave was, and he walked away marveling that the resurrected king, the resurrected king was there and that through that, through him, through Jesus, Peter, man, it set his whole life aflame and he becomes an incredible ambassador for Jesus and he, he start, he's there 50 days later when the church starts and he launches this church and it sets whole, the whole course of Peter's life on fire, the resurrection does, and he doesn't ever look back. He never goes back to to mundaneness. He never goes back to brokenness or shame or defeat. He just lives in him powerfully because he got a hold of the fact that the resurrected king was resurrecting him. And for you and I, we cannot go on any longer. If you're in Christ, then the old is gone. The Bible says that if you are in Christ, the old is gone. It's done away with. Stop living in it like you're, stop living like darkness is going to win. The good news, the gospel, this story is the good news of Jesus. And yet so many followers of Jesus walk around like defeated and mundane like the other 11 apostles sitting there, woe is me, but not Peter. Run back to the grave like Peter. See again and walk away marveling. Even if you follow Jesus your whole life, maybe you need to do that this morning. Come back and lock, lock in on Jesus again because the resurrected king wants to resurrect you. The resurrected king doesn't want us to live lives that are just normal that are just going through life, that are just won by defeat. He wants us to come and have life. And the way Jesus described it was that I have come that you may have life and life to the full. 
life abundantly in Jesus. That's what he calls us to. And some of you need to tap into that for the very first time and give your life to Jesus so you can experience the resurrected king resurrecting you. And all of us in here, whether or not you grew up in the church like born in the back pew essentially like I was, or that you maybe this is your first time in church, we all must come again to the grave this morning, to the tomb this morning, and see that our King Jesus has risen. He is not there. And that the resurrected King, by his spirit, we will rise from the ashes of defeat. We're going to sing a song in a moment that says just that. And I hope that this is a song, a declaration of victory. The, 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 the bridge to this song, which I love, this song just makes my heart come alive. It says, by your spirit, I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. And sometimes, and some of us may have walked in here in the ashes of defeat this morning, and it feels like you're just sitting there in defeat. Allow the resurrected king to resurrect you this morning and lift you, because that's what he wants. That's what he promises. That's what the life that he gives to those who believe and follow him and become his disciples. I don't know where you're at this morning. And... I hope that in the midst of this message and in the midst of discovering the story together, you found yourself in the story. I know I did. And that we follow the example of the people we looked at in the story. Maybe you're like the women who doubted and the women who, who didn't forgot, they just forgotten. Maybe you've forgotten this morning. Maybe you've forgotten. Maybe you've doubted from the very beginning. And you've, you're not quite sure that this story's even real. That's okay. That's all right. But come and investigate it. Come and look at the grave again. Maybe some of us are like Peter that needs to rise and run back and look into that tomb and realize that the good news of Jesus, the good news, not the bad news, the good news is that our king is alive. And that because our king is alive, because he's resurrected, he's resurrecting us from the inside out to live victoriously in Christ. The grave, grave conqueror wants to make us conquerors in this world. Wherever you find yourself this morning, we're going to sing this song in just a moment, and there's going to be prayer teams on both sides of the up here. And if you need prayer in your life, maybe things are just, you just feel like you're in defeat, and you're just sitting there in defeat. You need prayer. Come up and be prayed for. I'm going to be standing right here, and if, if, if you need to talk, if you're if you not sure the story's even true, or maybe you just you need to make that step and give your life to Jesus, come down in the, in the, in the middle of a song or come at, at the end of the song and just come talk to me. I'd love to talk with you, and I'd love nothing more to help introduce you again to Jesus. But for all of us in this song, while we're singing this song, I, I pray that you, I pray that you find yourself. I pray that you find yourself in light of our King and that you see yourself in light of our King, that he's resurrected and he's resurrecting us. Let me pray for us. Jesus, Jesus, you are victorious. King Jesus, you are alive and you are victorious. And we worship a King this morning who's not in the grave. He's not defeated. Death didn't win Life wins, light wins because of Jesus, because of you, Jesus. And so often I know that I live like I'm defeated, but we are not defeated. We have life because of you, Jesus, and we, we want to experience what you call us to, the life you've called us to, Jesus. Not making assumptions based on the things we think we know. Not like the women who made their assumption based on their circumstances. I pray that we don't do that. I, don't, I pray that we don't make our assumptions about life based on what we think's going on. But we come back to you. We come to the tomb and we look in and we see you're alive. We go to your word, Jesus, and we, we investigate and we see that, that you're true. And that because this story is true, it changes everything about everything in my life and in our lives. Jesus, we want to be close to you. I pray that you would, you would revive us again this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing. If you need prayer, anytime.